Communication is one of the clearest windows into the mind. Just as our speech is the most clear window into our minds, very often looking at how animals communicate can teach us about how they think. I'm a cognitive biologist and I'm interested in understanding how animals communicate and how they think. I have worked with so many species in my life. I started with fish, I've worked with frogs, I've worked a lot with alligators, I've worked a lot with various primates, with monkeys, with chimpanzees. Lately we're working with whales, I've worked with deer, pigs. One of the things that we're interested in is these display vocalizations that the ravens do in spring. And it's a way of kind of showing off. So they're very elaborate, they puff. It's not just a song, it's a dance as well. You could spend the, your whole life studying ravens and not even start to understand. They're certainly one of the most intelligent and most fascinating of bird species. They can learn to imitate human speech. They have friends that last for life. Um, if you separate two ravens for years, years later they can hear their sounds and still remember, ah, that's my friend. And we record those with audio and with video, and then we're interested in how they learn these. And then we start to analyze those with computers, and depending on the question, we use very different computer algorithms. Is it individually distinctive, or are there dialects? Most of the songbirds in Austria sing differently from the same birds, the same species in the UK, or in France, or in Spain. that I grew up in was surrounded by forests. So there were deer and foxes and many different bird species all around. My grandmother and grandfather were great influences on me in that they loved nature. They loved to go out in nature, they loved birds, they knew the names of all the trees and all the species. When I found a dead bird, a bird had hit our window, and I just picked it up and just to hold it and look at its feathers and look at its beak and, and then I, later I learned how to dissect and open it up and look inside and look at the muscles and the bones. There was just something so amazing about seeing what's inside of these, these animals. My mother was not necessarily happy about all the dead things that I dragged home. I already had this idea that being a scientist I could spend my life doing what I love to do, which is being among, being out in nature, being with animals, and trying to understand what they're doing. fascination with sound and with, with voices in particular is really goes back to the beginning of my life. Earth has not anything to show more I was in a salsa band that was quite successful, so we played all up and down the East Coast from, from Boston, New York, down to, to DC. Um, so we had 13 people. We're, we're playing, we're singing, we're dancing, and a room full of people are dancing with you. And the whole group is, is in the same rhythm, is having a great time. People are laughing and singing along. There's nothing like that. It's, the, it's one of the best experiences ever. I get, I get shivers up and down my spine just remembering that kind of experience. The key thing that music is good at is really bringing people together. In our ancestors, that music played a crucial role in bringing groups together and making them feel good about each other so that they could work together as a group. Yeah. 
I have no, no doubts that I did the right thing by becoming a scientist. If we could tell that a pig is in pain just by making a recording of its vocalizations, of its grunts or of its squeals, that would be quite useful because then we could, for example, um, you know, change the thing that's causing it distress, et cetera, et cetera. So for animal welfare, I think there's great importance in understanding animal vocalizations. I'm Tecumseh Fitch and I'm a cognitive biologist.